Okay, welcome back, everybody. As always, at first, are there any questions from last time? If not, then this is a little reminder of what we're in the middle of. We're in the middle of taking the functional derivative of AB and setting it to zero so that we can find this optimal approximate posterior Q of theta i. So Q star is going to be our optimal posterior. I will start with the step where we ended. So I'll write that on the board again. The last thing we had before we uh, stopped yesterday. And this is just after we took the um, derivative. We were left with four terms. And those were integral phi of theta i times integral of Q of theta not I. And then the log joint. And then we're integrating over theta not I and theta I over all the thetas. <laughs> And minus first the outer integral over theta uh, phi theta i, and then the inner integral, which is the expectation over q theta not i. logarithm of all the Q's. So Q theta I times Q theta not I. And then again, we're integrating over theta not I. This is the inner integral and the outer integral over theta I. This was the second term we were, lo um, we were left with. And now the most interesting one was the third term. Again, no, not again, but this time the integral over Q of theta i is the outer integral and then we take the inner integral and this looks interesting. So what we wrote was Q of theta not i and then we have this fraction of phi theta i, q theta not i, q theta i, and q theta not i. And then let's finish it before we talk about it. We're integrating over d theta not i and d theta i. Now if we quickly look at this, you see that I've introduced this. This actually cancels, right? And also this. actually cancels. And the only reason I wrote that is because we're going to need it in the next step. So actually the only meat in the integral is function phi. And this is just to be able to take this apart 
into terms that we can interpret. Yes? Theta not I. So this is the, um, oh, sorry. The first one is the right one. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, yes. Okay, yes, that was the one I was thinking of. You are absolutely right. Perfect, thank you. So, and the fourth term is the simplest one. This is the one with our Lagrange multiplier here. Lambda i times the integral over phi i, phi theta i. Theta i. So that's all. We already had this yesterday. And now we're just going to algebra algebraically turn this around and end up with terms we can interpret. So the first thing is, if we deal with the first term up here, this is simply an expectation in here, the inner integral. That's the expectation over this distribution of the log joint. So just write log here. So I write log here. And we're going to write it like that. So we're going to say this is the integral. We're going to write the outer integral, phi of theta i. And then the in, inner integral, we're just going to write with these angle brackets that will indicate the expectation of the log joint. Undo this distribution that we're going to write as Q not I. And then we're integrating over the theta i. So this is now our first term. And the second term, we're going to take apart. Um, no, we're just going to write it like this, minus phi i, or phi theta i to be exact. log q theta i and then we have this integral here we can take this log q theta i um, outside because this is the integral over theta not i so we can take this outside the inner integral so the inner integral now starts here. And we have q theta not i in here. And this is what we're integrating over. And then we have to close the outer integral. Now what is this? What is this? What exactly? This evaluates to unity, so we can forget about it. Then, turning to further terms we have, next thing is minus integral phi over theta i. And then the inner integral we have is q of theta not i. log q of theta not i 
d theta not i, d theta i. Now this here, what is this? In the second one here, there is a log q theta not i that I missed, you're saying. Minus phi theta i log q theta not i. Q theta not i, d theta. Yes, so, so we're going through the terms one by one. So we're, we're taking everything apart here. So in the end, everything should be accounted for. If, we, if you're still not happy, once we're through with all the terms, because we're taking them apart and reassembling them, then shout. But in the meantime, what is this? Entropy, exactly. So this is the entropy of the distribution Q not I. Then, further stuff we have to deal with is this term here, phi theta i times, again, q of theta not i, d theta not i, d theta i, and again, as before, this here evaluates to unity, and the last little term, I'm going to write it up above here, is simply, again, the Lagrange multiplier, the integral phi theta i. And then we go on after wiping the board. Everybody finished here? Next, we have, we're going to take everything together, the whole integral over phi theta i. One big parenthesis. So this is the expectation that we have there. Expectation of the log joint. under q theta not i. Minus log q to i. Minus the entropy of the distribution q not i. Minus 1 plus the Lagrange multiplier. Then we integrate over theta 1, theta i. And now we're going to give these things names. So we're going to call this. the variational energy. We already have that in the slides. So the expected log joint, and actually the negative, the expected negative log joint is going to be an energy because negative log probabilities are energies. So we're going to put a minus sign here in the definition so this is the I of 
beta i. Because this is integrated over all thetas with index other than i, so it is still a function of theta i. All the other thetas have been integrated away. It's the expected log joint under all the other distributions over theta where theta is not theta i. So this is a simple function of theta i. Now here, this whole thing we're going to call minus log z minus log z i because this is for the ith partition and importantly this is constant with respect to theta i. So there's no difficulty in integrating over this, right? It doesn't depend on theta i. Yes, question? Sorry? Should it be plus the entropy is the question? It, we have a minus sign here. Entropy minus? You're right. So should I have written a minus sign here? Um, yes, you could. Yes. We're going to write plus here. And this minus the end. Thank you. Um, equals const. So this is a constant with respect to theta i. We have no problem integrating it. So, what we end up with is, in its simplified form, the expectation over minus i of theta i minus log q of theta i minus log of z i under the distribution phi i and this is Because we started out that way, this is the expectation of the functional derivative on f with respect to qi under phi i. And this means that we can now write our optimal q if we set this to zero. This means
our optimal QI is characterized by the functional derivative being zero and the functional derivative here is minus i theta i minus log q of theta i minus log zi and this should be zero at the extremum. So this is what we write. And we solve for our Q here. So we have the optimal Q as one over zi <coughs> exponential of minus i of theta i. So that's the culmination of our whole work we've been doing. We've seen that if we do the mean field approximation, we partition our variables theta into groups indexed by i, then the approximate posterior over um, the approximate posterior has this shape in the ith partition. And I called this Z because this is the usual way to call the normalization constant that gives you a probability distribution from an exponentiated quantity. And the quantity that we've exponentiated here is the negative variational energy. And the definition of the variational energy was that it was the negative log joint expected under all the other Qs. The Qs where J is unequal, the Qs of theta J where J is unequal to I. And this is the exact same thing here on the slide. Here I gave Q a star to show that it is the um, optimal Q. Any questions about this? Yes. Yes. So if we say this is Q star, the one that fulfills this equation, out of all the Qs that fulfill this equation, this is the one we give a star to. So our optimal Q star is K. Yes? It is a mean field approximation because we have taken all of our thetas, basically in our case where we do inference, all of the states and parameters in the outside world that we want to infer on. In physics, that would be your particles. These are all our thetas. Mm. 
And we said the posterior, the approximate posterior, so P of theta, given our observations Y and our model M, is approximated by a function Q of theta. And this Q of theta is the product of over an index set J of the Q of theta J. And in, in very general, these J's, these index sets J, so you get an index for each partition of thetas that you take here. You can take several thetas into one partition, if you like. But mostly you take one theta into one of your partitions describing one particle. And this is, amounts physically to saying, OK, if I have, in the uh, simplest example, I have three particles, one here, one here, one here. Now, if I start looking at how this one influences this one, and I change the way this one works, the state of this one, on the basis of this influence, then we have a change in the influence on this one. And this, in turn, influences this one, so we have to update that one. And we cannot do this at the same time. And this is why we say we look at one at a time, and we look at the mean field that the other particles are creating to influence that particle. And this is what we're doing here. Um, when we take the expectation over the log joint of all the other particles. So this is our expectation on all the other part particles, all the other partitions in our uh, parameter space. And we say this variational energy is what and this is only a function of that partition in which we're interested in, of that particle we're interested in, because we've integrated over all the others. And that is the mean field. Yes? So, In general, it is not true that probability distributions can be factorized like this. So you will always have to consider that this is an approximation. And it may work in practice, but there's no guarantee. Yes. So let's put it this way. I cannot give you any guarantees. So people are working on <coughs> developing guarantees like this. All I can say here to you is there is no guarantee that it will work. It may work in practice, but there's no guarantee. And it's an active field of research and developing guarantees for approximations. But in practice, people often use approximations um, to see whether they work. And usually, because this is an efficient way to do inference, you have ways to do inference that are much less efficient, but allow you to check whether this is working. So if you solve a problem approximately like this, and you have a big enough cluster, you can go and try to find the posterior using sampling. And then you can compare them, and then, you know, because sampling is, um, if you have infinite time, going to give you um, a posterior that looks like the true posterior, you have a way uh, to check whether this works. So, and in the practical application where I use this, 
what I did was I, I built a, I used this for time series, and then I built a particle filter, a particle filter it's called. So it's basically sampling across time steps. So you, you take a, an ensemble of particles, and then you do your time update, and you, you look where it sits, and then you take the next time update, and so on. It's very inefficient, and, and it, it can very easily break, but we, at some point we got it to work, and using this particle filter, we saw that in the case we were applying this, um, it actually worked, it gave us the same thing. Um, so, we will, I can give you the example that we will do. So, in this hierarchical Gaussian filtering model we're going to look at, we have a hierarchy of states called x1, x2, x3, and then it goes up to xn. You can add as many as you like. And then you have a time dimension because it's a time series. So this is at time point k, k. And then you get a next time step. x3 at time k plus 1, x2 at time k plus 1, x1 at time k plus 1. And then we partition it like this. Simply, each one has its own posterior Gaussian. This is our partition. Um, that's because um, it's missing in the slide. So people, and um, I've been inspired by bad examples, but people in information theory often uh, define energies the other way around than physicists do. This is the way physicists have them. So the higher your energy, the lower your probability. So in the Boltzmann distribution, this is the way it works. So you, you have a lower probability to be at a higher energy. But then you always have these minus signs everywhere. And in information theory, people sometimes, out of um, a false sense of convenience, um, just invert the sign there. And that's what happened in my slide. Other questions? Good. So, after this long slog, another thing we need to look at is the Laplace approximation. The basic idea of the Laplace approximation is that you take a probability distribution and you enforce a Gaussian shape on it. And it's called the Laplace approximation because Laplace first did this with the beta distribution. So let me say, I think this is chapter three here. Laplace approximation. Who is not familiar with the beta distribution? Some of you, yes. So the beta distribution is this. It describes your uncertainty about the quantity in the unit interval. So you have zero here, and you have one here. And you don't know where on the line your quantity is. 
So your probability distribution will look something like this. So it's a distribution that you use when you have a quantity that you're uncertain about on a bounded interval. So it's bounded below, bounded above. And somewhere here it is. Let's say you get a coin and you don't know whether this coin is fair. So you want the coin to give you one half head and one half tails, but it may not be fair. And how do you find that out? You toss the coin. You keep tossing it. And the more you toss it, the more you find out about how probable heads it is as opposed to tails. And what you're doing as you're finding this out is you're updating your beta distribution about where this parameter sits. The parameter of the Bernoulli distribution is going to be your probability for heads. So that may be one half. It may be three quarters or whatever. And as you reduce your uncertainty, you get a narrower and narrower beta distribution. Anyways, Laplace knew this already 200 years ago, and he found it inconvenient because the functional form of the beta distribution um, has um, gamma functions inside and so on. It's not very tractable. So he said, yes, So, yes. So, I was just using it as an example, but I will um, give you, um, maybe I will give you the functional form. I will just look it up. I don't know it by heart. Or I'm not sure I would get it right. So, it'll be something like, let me guess it and then let's check it. Um, Probability of x, if this is x, parameterized by alpha and beta is, don't write this down, it's going to be corrected, something like gamma function of alpha times gamma function of beta divided by gamma function of alpha plus beta times x to the, what is it, x to the alpha and 1 minus x to the beta, something like that. Beta distribution. Let's see how close I was. Yeah, here. Okay. I mixed up the denominator and the um, numerator, but otherwise I was fine. Oh, there is a minus one. Yep. So this is your beta distribution. And the interpretation for alpha and beta is you have your two possible outcomes, and you count them. So alpha is your count of heads in the coin toss, uh, coin -toss um, example, and beta is your count of tails. So alpha plus beta is the number of times you've tossed the coin. and This is how it gets narrower and narrower if you toss your coin again and again. 
And for alpha zero and beta zero, you've got a flat distribution, which is, of course, located at one, and it's flat like this. And if you, of course, one times one is one, so this is your density. Sorry? Uh, well, it depends on whether you put in the minus one here, I think. So there are different parametrizations. Let me see how, this is the one I took from Wikipedia. Yes, we can check that and uh, say that next time. I think when you parameterize it the way it's been done here with the minus one here, then um, if you start with a, you have the one then, yeah. Good, so this is your beta distribution. Now, Laplace thought this was um, complicated to work with. He preferred to work with Gaussians. So he said, well, let's go and fit a Gaussian in here. Now, of course, this is in some way absurd because the Gaussian will have probability mass outside the unit interval. So it will spread out too far. But Laplace found out that this worked well anyway, because if you're close to the peak, the approximation is very good, as long as you're not far away from the peak. So using a Gaussian as an approximation to at the peak of your distribution has, been, has come to be called the Laplace approximation. And that's what we're going to do in general here. That's just the basic idea of it. Yes? No, that's, just, that's a historical remark. Don't get hung up on the beta distribution. I just wanted to make a quick remark on the history of the Laplace approximation, why it's called the Laplace approximation. Don't worry about the beta distribution. I only wrote it down because somebody asked the question. So this is not about the beta distribution. Just a quick historical remark. Switch away. So, what we want to do is take our posterior, P of theta given y and m, as always, and we want to approximate it by a Gaussian Q. So now we're going to fill our Q with some meat, with some content. So we're going to say our Q will be Gaussian, which specifically means it is parameterized by a mean and a covariance. So this is a capital sigma because it's a matrix, it's a covariance matrix, and this is the mean vector mu. And this is Gaussian, so this is an N, theta, parameterized by mu and sigma.
And the definition of the Gaussian is in d dimensions 2p, 2 pi minus d half. Then this is the determinant, sorry, of sigma. The root of the determinant of sigma. Minus one half of the inverse of it. And then the exponential of minus one half theta minus mu transpose the inverse of sigma and theta minus mu. So if you remember your linear algebra, This is a column vector, this is a row vector, and this is a square matrix. So what does this give us in here? What kind of tensor is this? It's a scalar, yes. So we exponentiate the scalar, and we have a scalar probability here. Good. So, we'll do some notation and preliminaries before we derive the specifics of the Laplace approximation. So, we're going to say um, if a function has theta in its, in its index, that means that this is the partial derivative, sorry, of f with respect to theta. Huh? We're just going to use the index theta as a sign for the derivative. And, of course, if we use two thetas, then that'll mean we've taken the second derivative. And then we will define the quantity L. So we're dealing with the Laplace approximation. This is a function of theta. And this is defined as the log joint. So for the log joint, we're just going to write L of theta just to make things simpler. Because theta is the only variable in here. Why are our observations? They're fixed. We've made them. We cannot change them. They're not variable. The model is M is our model. So the only variable in here is theta. So some preliminaries. For a, sorry? What the? What the large sigma is, yeah. it is a covariance matrix. Okay. So, so in your, in your Gaussian, in one dimension, this is characterized by two quantities. You have the mean, mu. In this case, this is a scalar, because we're in one dimension. And then the width is characterized by the standard deviation. The variance is the square of the standard deviation, so it's equivalent. We're going to describe 
the variance by the letters sigma. And now we expand this to several dimensions. And this gives us a covariance matrix. This will now be a vector, and this will be a matrix. To give you an intuition for that, let's look at two dimensions, x1, x2. And now we're going to place a Gaussian distribution on this plane. So we're going to use contour lines. So let's basically put a Gaussian like this, sort of aligned with the axes here. These are the contour lines of the Gaussian. And this is now mu. And it's a vector. So mu1, mu2 equals mu. This is the center of our two-dimensional distribution. And now, if the Gaussian is, has two axes here that are aligned with the axes of the coordinate system, then our sigma will be a diagonal matrix. So I'm going to write sigma in this way. So here we have the variance along the first dimension. All diagonal terms are zero. Then we have the variance along the second dimension. The two variances. Now you start needing the off diagonal terms as soon as your Gaussian isn't aligned with the axes anymore. If you have one that's sort of lying like this, you're going to get off diagonal terms, which are the covariances between uh, the values on the different um, dimensions that you have. So if you have a cloud of dots, that's going to be my third point here, you have a cloud of dots here and you know that they were drawn from a Gaussian, you can estimate the covariance matrix by taking the variance in this direction, and that goes in here, the variance in this direction, that goes in here, and the covariance between the two dimensions goes in here because this is symmetric. So it'll always be here. Covariance, covariance matrices are always symmetric and positive definite. What does positive definite mean? All the eigenvalues are positive, exactly. Because if you diagonalize your covariance matrix, it is geometrically impossible for the um, variance in any direction to be negative. It would be absurd. It wouldn't make sense. So it has to be a positive definite symmetric matrix. Other questions? So let's start our preliminaries over here. <laughs> For a D times D matrix A,
we have the expectation under a distribution Q of a term like theta minus mu transposed times A times theta minus mu. You already know where this is going. Huh? Uh, if you look at the back, we might have some gas we've had. Oops. Thank you. We'll write this out. So we'll take it apart. Expectation of the sum. Now this is not this is not a matrix. This is a sum. Huh? Sum over theta i minus mu i, and then the element of the matrix A are the ij's, and then we have theta j minus mu j. So this is simply you know, this written out with indices. Again, the expectation on the cube. And now we can take um, all the terms that don't depend on theta, because this is Q of theta. We can take them out of the integral. So what we're left with, and we can take the sum out of the integral. So we have the sum outside here. And inside the sum, we are left with theta i minus mu i and theta j minus mu j expectation under q times the elements of a ij. Now what is this? If we look at this Yes, or correlation is not covariance. Exactly, that's the definition of your covariance. So, oops, 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 oops. Microphone's getting tired. So, I don't know what I can do here. I hope this will help. So, this is our covariance matrix. Um, so, this is. A, Specifically, the ijth element of the covariance matrix. And if you remember your linear algebra, if you have the sum over ij of the ijth element of one matrix times the ijth element of the other matrix, this gives you the trace of the product of the matrices. So. TR is for trace. This will just be useful in what follows. It's just linear round. Now, if the matrix A in here is the um, covariance itself, then this simplifies radically. <laughs> Specifically, a 
expectation of um, theta minus mu transposed sigma minus one. This is as it is in the Gaussian there. Sigma minus mu here. Expectation on the Q. Then this is, of course, now the trace of sigma, sigma minus one. How much is this? D, exactly, D. So I'll interpose one. So this is the, um, uh, of the identity in D space, and this is D. Trace of the identity is D. Good. This is just something we need to remember. So now let's start. Let's look at the free energy under the Laplace approximation. Let's just say F under the Laplace approximation. So, this is the expectation under Q of the log joint, which is a function of theta. plus the entropy of Q. And now, this is the, the definition of F. So we take these two and treat them separately. So first, I'm going to look at the first term. And we'll see what that happens, what happens there. brackets. So this is the expectation, just another way to write it, of L of theta on the Q. And this is, I should write, approximately, because now we're doing the Laplace approximation. And how do we do the Laplace approximation? We expand the log joint to second order. Anybody not familiar with the Taylor approximation? Everybody's laughing. <laughs> I know. I know. So we're being good physicists here and we're doing a Taylor expansion. The thing is, if you take a probability distribution, you exponentiate it. I know if you, you take the logarithm of a probability distribution, and this probability distribution happens to be a Gaussian, what do you get? What is a log Gaussian, if you take the log of a Gaussian? What shape, sorry? You get a quadratic function. So what we want to have is a quadratic approximation to our log joint. 
And as soon as we have that quadratic approximation, we go and exponentiate it, and there is our Gaussian. So this is our log joint, and now we're going to expand it inside the expectation here. And we're going to expand it at a point that we're going to call mu. This is our expansion point. This is where the peak of the Gaussian will sit. So we have lambda of mu plus the derivative of lambda with respect to theta, according to our notation of L to theta, yeah. So it's not a lambda. What? I don't know why I'm saying lambda. It's an L. Times this mu. So this is a gradient. Gradient is a row vector. And here we have this theta minus mu. So multiplied together, we again have the scalar that we need. No, it's not an outer product, it's a, it's a dot product. Plus one half. Yeah, I mean, you know this. It's, it's just a Taylor expansion. Huh? And um, so here we have L theta theta, which is a matrix times theta minus mu. And this is all inside our expectation. And now we take the constant parts out. This is, of course, a, sorry, this is a constant, doesn't depend on theta. So it's outside our expectation here. So like this, plus the derivative evaluated at mu is also not dependent on theta. And then we're left with the expectation of theta minus mu under Q plus one half times the expectation of theta minus mu transposed L theta theta evaluated at mu theta minus mu. Q. Now this simplifies. Who sees in what sense this simplifies? What happens to this? It will be zero, exactly. Exactly. This vanishes. Yes? Exactly. Yes. So this is basically um, sort of the expectation of theta. I mean, you could do it in several steps. So you could take the minus mu outside. That gives you just minus mu. And then inside, you're left with theta. But the expectation of theta is mu. So we've got mu minus mu. And here, what do we have here? According to what we saw, this is the trace of the covariance, because we can rearrange this. We can take this and this together, and then we get the covariance, because we can should, should I do this in several steps, or does everybody see why this is the case? Now, 
Now, typically, the ones who don't see why it is the case won't say so. So I will Exactly, yes. So, so you can, uh, uh, what I am using here is the fact that if you multiply these together, you can take this here outside, because it doesn't depend on theta, then you're left with this inside, and that's the definition of sigma. That gives you a trace of sigma times L. Let's try something else here. So we're going to leave it at that. We're going to say in total this first term of the free energy. Continuing here is simply the log joint evaluated the log joint evaluated at mu plus one half the trace of the covariance times the log joint the second derivative of the log joint evaluate that mu. This is our, our first term. Now we turn to the second term, which is the entropy term. This is the negative of the log expect of the expectation of the log of q of theta under q it's the definition of the entropy and now we simply take the definition of the gaussian that we saw before and this gives us the expectation of d half number of dimensions in half log 2 pi plus 1 half log determinant plus, we continue here, plus one half theta minus mu transposed inverse of the covariance theta, sorry, theta minus mu. On the cube. Now this, taking everything out of the expectation that we can take out. We have, of course, d half log 2 pi plus 1 half log determinant of the covariance plus one half again this or not again maybe term and this we know from before is equal to D so, all in all, 
we have D half log two P two pi, sorry, two pi E. That's from here. To incorporate the one half D into here. Um, plus one half log determinant. Let's make this a bit. Oh, so I disregarded the line under which I shouldn't write. Is there any way I can? Um, I'll write this line again up here. I'll copy it up here so you can see it. D half log 2 pi e plus 1 half log determinant of the covariance. And this means the free energy under the Laplace approximation is by taking the two terms together, the log joint evaluated at the point mu plus one half trace of covariance times the Hessian. So you may remember from calculus, sometimes call this the Hessian, the um, second derivative of a function in multiple dimensions. Hessian. And plus d half log 2 pi e plus one half log determinant uh, of the covariance. Now, challenge is now or let's say I'll ask you what the challenge is here what are we going to do next what, what do we have to do exactly exactly we need to minimize F we find we have to find the optimal mu and sigma. So basically, we take the derivative with respect to sigma. How do we do that? Variation? No, we're going to do we're going to do it straight up, exact and analytic. Not variational calculus. We can do that. So we first have to look at how we take the derivative of a function with respect to a matrix. Yeah. Because sigma is a matrix. So it's not just a scalar variable. We're going to take the derivative with respect to a matrix. This will um, require a little work. Um, so. Sorry? Uh, 
Yes, in essence, this is what we will do. It will just look a bit more elegant what we do. Yes? Um, this is because we, we um, have the energy definitions negative. It's the same thing as before. So because this is basically a negative energy, and this is also um, a negative energy, the one we had, then they have the same sign as the entropy. So you may remember last time we defined as F was minus AB. So that's the key to this. F is minus AV. So F is a negative energy. OK. So the conditional variance sigma so let's, I will just write the goal down. Goal. Find the variance sigma that maximizes F It's a negative energy, that's why we're maximizing it. With respect, yeah. So, we set the derivative to zero and solve for sigma. What we do is, again, we have a few preliminaries, We say the vectors E1, E2, up to ED are an orthonormal basis of RD. Then the next preliminary is the partial derivative with respect to sigma. So we're taking the sigma of this trace. So this will help us later. We'll use this result in the actual calculation. So this is the first preliminary now. We have a second preliminary. Yes? Yes? Exactly. We're going to use that. We're going to use that, exactly, yes. So that'll simplify everything. So first we'll do this, and then basically in the first step, we can simply say without loss of generalization, without loss of generality, I should say, we can assume that sigma is diagonal with respect to this basis here. That's exactly what we're going to do. So this is simply D 
safe map of the sum. I'm sorry, this is a sum sign. This is another sigma. JK, or KL, sorry, KL. Otherwise, I'll get confused later. KL of um, sigma, the elements of sigma KL and the elements of ALK. That's the definition of the trace. And now we're going to have to unpack this here. What does it mean, this partial derivative with respect to sigma? It means the sum over the ij. And these are the partial derivatives with respect to the elements of sigma, ij. So this is one element of sigma, the ij element. And now inside the derivative, we have what we had before, this sum over k and l, the elements of sigma, k, l, and the elements of a, l, k. And now, because this is a matrix, we're going to write the tensor product of the vectors here. So this comes right here. You have the tensor product of the basis vectors EI, EJ. And this gives us the sum of ij, delta ik. So these are chronic deltas, delta jl, alk. You're also all familiar with the chronic delta. It's equal to 1 when um, i is equal to k and 0 otherwise. And Again, our basis vectors. And this simplifies to sum ij a j i is basically linear algebra and the basis vectors EI tends to product EJ. And this is equal to So here we have JI and here we have I and J. Exactly. This is equal to A transfer. So, intuitively, you can calculate with matrices as you would with scalars. So, you, this is basically taking the product of sigma times A, and this is basically just like saying, well, I want to take the derivative of D of DX of AX, and this gives you A. And this is the equivalent with matrices. Instead of the product here, you have the trace here. But it's just it's the multi-dimensional generalization of this.
So, the second thing we'll do, now this is a first preliminary was the basis vector, this was the second preliminary, now a third preliminary. What happens when we try to take the derivative of the log determinant of sigma with respect to sigma? We're going to have to think about that a little. What happens when we try to do that? So, as you already said, without loss of generality, we can assume that sigma is diagonal with respect to the basis we have because it's symmetric and positive definite. That means it's always diagonalizable. We can always find this basis, the basis of vectors E i and E j where sigma is diagonal. We assume without loss of generality that we're working in this basis. So, this whole thing simplifies to derivative with respect to sigma of the log, uh, log of the product of the diagonal elements. So, this is simply sigma K, K, like this. And now we're going to take the product out of the logarithm, and we're left with a sum over K of the log elements, log diagonal elements. And again, we're going to use the same definition of this partial derivative as over there. So this is the derivative with respect to the ij element in here of the sum over the log diagonal elements. Sorry. with the basis vectors E, I, E, J. And this gives us sigma I, J. And again, Kronecker deltas, delta I, K, delta J, K. 1 over, because that's the derivative of the logarithm. I think you remember that. I, E, J. And this is, what is this? It's a matrix again. The inverse, the inverse of sigma, exactly. So this is the inverse of sigma. And again, wondrously, we see that stuff works in multiple dimensions. So taking the logarithm of x, when x is a scalar, gives you 1 over x. Taking the derivative of Sigma with respect to sigma, when sigma is a mate of the determinant of sigma, I have to say, sorry. You, you have to take the determinant, but then you get the inverse 
as the derivative. Yes? I may very well have in here, right? So did I, did I, did I, did I? No, 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 no. I think yes. I um, so why would I need the sum over k? Okay, okay, right. So I will need to introduce the sum over k here. Or uh, out here. So, ah, okay. Probably here. That's good. So if we get to k, this only counts if i is equal to k and j is equal to k, so if it's a diagonal element, and then we insert, yes, and then we insert um, the inverse of the k diagonal element, and this gives us the matrix here. Right, thank you. So, the derivative with respect to sigma of the free energy is one half. of the Hessian evaluate that mu plus the inverse of the covariance. And now if we set this to zero, What follows is that we need to choose as our sigma, as our optimal sigma. So I'm give it a, going to give it a star again. Sigma star is minus the Hessian evaluate that view. So we take our log join. We calculate its Hessian at the point where we want to have our Laplace approximation. So we choose the point mu where we do our quadratic expansion. Yes? It, yes. So mu, the way this is practically often done, but not always. And if, it's, if you do the pure Laplace approximation, you find the maximum. And then you take the log joint, calculate the Hessian, and use this as the covariance, of the negative of it, as the covariance of your, um, uh, and here, instead of the star, and in addition to the star. So, yeah, I'm going to lose the star in this. Okay. We need the inverse. Yes? We shall see. Yeah. 
In practice, you don't. In practice, you don't. Yeah, that's one of the problems of um, proving this. In practice, you do not. You never know. I mean, you. It, it's hard to get a guarantee for a global optimum. So, I, I mean, those are important questions, and, and people devote their careers to doing to finding guarantees for global optima. But um, in practice, you almost never have a guarantee for a global optima. Good. So this is where we stop for today. If today wasn't enough for you, tomorrow you're going to get the double dose. <laughs> Um, anyway, try to digest this. If any questions appear, we'll have enough time tomorrow to deal with them. So um, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>